We're so glad you guys are here today. Glad that y'all made it out. And man, I'm, I'm going to ask y'all, if you would, to, uh, to take out your Bibles. You guys got your Bibles with you today? You got those? Hold them up real quick. All across the room, you got them? You got them? Good, good, good. Turn over. I got two places I want to take you to today. Two places. I want to take you to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah. Go to Psalms. Take a right. Isaiah chapter... 61, and then I also want to take you into the New Testament and to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 4. Today, we actually end up finishing. This is kind of us coming to an end of summer months. Soon, fall will be here, and we'll be putting on sweaters because it'll be 89 degrees. So here we are at the end of the summer, and this summer we've been doing a series um, that we called Summer Attire. And we talked about putting on the different things that God shows us inside of Scripture. We, we looked at putting on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness. We talked about putting on holiness and what that looks like. We talked about putting on Christ from Romans 13, 14. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And so today, we, we, we finish this summer series with a message that I'm calling who wore it best? Who wore it best? Now, those, there are many of y'all that you, you've heard that term. You know what that term re refers to. But some of y'all are going, ah, okay, let me explain it. When you've got two different people wearing the same outfit, okay? You would see that in Hollywood all the time, somebody on the red carpet, and there would be these different people wearing the same outfits, and th then they would put it out on the internet, well, who wore it best? who looked best in this outfit. And so that was a continual thing that was taking place. Now, what got to be fun was along the way, um, it started getting humorous. And if you've ever seen some of these, it, 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 it got kind of fun. Uh, the competition of, of some of the people of, well, who actually, you know, got, got to wear that best. And, uh, you know, so... <laughs> It's a birthday. Come on, man. I thought we'd celebrate with her a little bit there. And, uh, and so we saw some of these, these examples of, well, who wore it best? <laughs> so today, what we're going to talk about as we finish talking about putting on the things of God, we're going to talk about the garment of praise, right? The garment of praise. For some of y'all, you've heard that phrase. Maybe you've heard it in a song. Maybe you're actually familiar with it in, inside of Scripture. The, the, the garment of praise. And so we're going to talk about who wore it better. Now, when I say who wore the garment of praise better, I'm not talking about whether that was, you know, Chris Tomlin or Bill Gaither. And I'm not talking about if that was Maverick City or if that was Elevation Worship. No, I'm talking about with us, between us, who wore worship better. Okay, well, Scott, we're the one who's the other. <laughs> that would be the devil. That'd be Satan. I know some of you are going, okay, stay with me. You see, when we look at Scripture, we see this picture of his name was Lucifer. And Lucifer was one of the top angels. It was Michael. It was Gabriel. It was Lucifer. And Lucifer, his name even means light bearer. He was the top angel. He was a covering over God. He was a, a surrounding, an anointing around God. And the scripture even tells us, and if you're taking notes, in, in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28, we get a description of Satan as Lucifer. And the picture that it gives us is, is that Satan was even made up of musical instruments. It talked about a tambourine. It talked about drums and the lyre. So in, in God creating Lucifer, he was this worship. But the problem was is that Lucifer didn't want worship to go through him. He wanted worship to come to him. And Lucifer wanted the seed of God. Well, we, we, we know the story that God kicked Lucifer out of heaven. And you ask the question, well, where did he kick him out to? People go, he's in hell. He's in hell. He's in hell. He's got a pitchfork, red spandex. He's in <laughs> no. He's right here on planet Earth. That's where God sent him to. 
this hell thing, okay, that happens later. Right now, where is he today? Planet Earth. Now, all that took place, real quick, stay with me. All that took place right before the first Adam came on the scene. Now, this is the Adam that we read about inside of the garden. And so, all that transpired there where Lucifer was this worship worshiper. He had a choice to worship God, but he wanted to be worshiped. It's like each one of us in this place. We have a choice. We have an invitation to worship, but it's a choice. Now, I, I told you that the first Adam showed up on the scene. Well, let's go ahead and fast forward. Let's go ahead and fast forward to the second Adam, and that would be Jesus. So if you've got your scripture, turn over to Luke chapter 4. Let me paint the picture of what's taking place here. At this point of Jesus' ministry, Jesus is rock star status. People know who he is. Jesus has been raising people from the dead. He's been giving sight to the blind. He's been teaching in ways that people are blown away with because he's doing it with such authority, but he's doing it with such love and such compassion. I mean, here's this Jesus who the religious people would look at the lepers and say, you need to stay on the other side of the street. And the scripture says that Jesus would go over to them. And the scripture says, and he touched him. Jesus would love the unlovely. He would touch the untouchable. He would speak to the unspeakable, and it was blowing the minds of the people. Jesus was teaching clarity in a confused world. He was bringing hope in a hopeless time. So here's Jesus now, and he, he comes into a synagogue. Just, just real quick, Jerusalem had the temple. That was, that was the Mac Daddy. The temple is where the Holy of Holy was. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And then what you would have is in each different city, you would have synagogues, right? These are just smaller temples. So Jesus, one day, he goes inside of this temple, and when he walks in, it's like everybody going, oh, they knew him. They knew who this guy was. This is this guy who's been doing miracles. Did you, did you hear the other day? He fed like 5,000. I was there. I was there. What was it? It was fish. It was good, man. And so they're talking about all these incredible things that Jesus has been doing. Jesus comes in, and the attendant of the, the service, he picks Jesus to do the reading. And he goes over, and he grabs the scroll. Keep in mind, guys, first, <laughs> there was no New Testament at this time. Y'all with me? Y'all got a time reference where we are? The second thing, there wasn't a book like this. You know what they had? They had scrolls, scrolls of each of the different books of the Bible. And so when Jesus came in, the attendant went over, and he just so happened to grab the scroll of Isaiah. Now, why is Isaiah important? One of the reasons Isaiah is important is because Isaiah spent so much time talking about the Messiah, the one that God sent, the one that God is going to send. It talks about this, this, this one who's favor God is going to have resting on him. It's going to talk about this anointed one. You see, listen. This Messiah who was going to come was going to set people free. This Messiah who was going to come, uh, he was going to give sight to the blind. He was going to do all these incredible things. So for years, people have been waiting for this Messiah to show up. And Jesus is there that day. And they hand him the book, the scroll of Isaiah. He opens it up and he goes to this passage. So right there, we, we, we look in, in Luke chapter 4, in verse 14, the scripture says this, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in the synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. Okay. Now keep in mind, the book of Isaiah is talking about this Messiah who's going to someday come. The book of Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus was born. So now he's handed the book of Isaiah, or scroll of Isaiah. He opens up, and this is what he reads. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recover of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Whoa! Did you hear that list? That's, that's a fantastic list. I mean, no wonder all the people were so excited about this Messiah coming. I mean, look, just real quick, let me go over a couple of things that when the Messiah comes, the things that he says he's going to do, it says he's going to proclaim good news to the poor. Oh, I love that. It says that he's going to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, those who are in bondage, those who are in captivity, those who are in slavery. He, he's going to bring freedom to them. He's, he's going to bring sight to the blind. He's going to set the oppressed free. And he's going to proclaim the year of the Lord. Well, no wonder everybody was so excited with great anticipation waiting for this Messiah. Now listen to this, verse 20. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, the scripture is being fulfilled in your presence. Now, for you and me, we know Jesus is the Messiah, so we kind of go, praise, that's great. I want you to go back to when Jesus was reading this. Those people have been waiting for the Messiah. This is God's anointed, and all of a sudden, this Jesus guy, he reads about the Messiah, and everybody's like, yeah, the Messiah, someday, someday. And then Jesus goes, and it's me. And the people were like, we're going to kill you. We here, because we know Jesus was the Messiah, we go, we're going to praise him. But that day, those people, they were ready. They were ready right there to kill him. Now, this whole thing was written about by Isaiah 700 years before Jesus was ever born. And when Jesus came, I want you to hear this. Please hear this. When Jesus came, he came with a purpose. He came, listen, he came with an agenda. Right? Today we got Dr. Parker, Dr. Barnes, Dr. Chad Will, they're here with us today. Maybe some of y'all walked in and went, oh, I wonder why they're here. Right? And if you ask them, Dr. Chad Will, why are you guys here? I, I don't think his response would be, what, well, you know, Boo Ray's did not open for another hour. So we just killing time. No. They came here with a purpose today. They came here with a purpose because they want to be a part of this celebration here today. They, they, they came here today because they wanted to be able to see part of this community face to face. And they wanted part of the community and the church community to be able to hear their heartbeats and to be able to hear their game plan, to be able to hear their mind. You see, when they came here today, they came with a purpose. I want you to hear something. When Jesus came, he didn't come here out of boredom. When Jesus showed up here, he came with a purpose purpose. He came with an agenda. I mean, so let's just do this. Can I take you to the actual? When, when Jesus was reading in, in Luke chapter 4, I want us to at, read the actual passage that Jesus was reading from. So if you've got your scripture still open, turn over to that Isaiah chapter 61. Because this is the passage that all those people that were there that day in that synagogue, when Jesus started reading from the book of Isaiah, everybody knew that passage. They were so familiar with that passage. This is the passage that Jesus read. It says this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair they will be called oaks of righteousness a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Real quick, let me just break those down again. 
What did Jesus come to do? He came with a purpose. What was his purpose? He said this, to comfort those who mourn. Now, can I just chase a quick little rabbit here? Notice Jesus didn't say, I came to take away everything that was difficult. Did you hear that? Because my friends, I, please hear me. I don't want you to think, Scott, if I choose this Jesus, if I decide to follow Jesus, that means he's going to take away all the difficult things in life, right? He's going to take away all the painful things in life, right? No, that's not what he does. Jesus never promised that if you decided to follow him, that he would take away the difficulties in life. What he did promise was that he would be with you in the middle of those difficulties. In the middle of the flood, Jesus said, I'm with you. In the middle of the divorce, in the middle of the bankruptcy, he said, I'll be with you. Joshua 1.9, I love that word where Jesus says this. Joshua 1.9 says, have I not commanded you? Didn't say a suggestion. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Why, why be strong and courageous? Because I know you're going to go through some difficult stuff. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The greatest sermon that some people will say that Jesus ever preached was the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. And it was inside of that sermon that Jesus would say this, blessed are those who mourn. Why? They're going to be comforted. Part of the reason of Jesus being here is, is that he was going to bring that comfort. 2 Corinthians 1.3 says this, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all. All. Say all. all. Who comforts us in all tribulation. Can, can, can I just speak a word of encouragement to some of you right now? Because maybe you're going through that painful time. Maybe you're going through that. You just got the bad report from the doctor. Maybe you just saw that pink slip show up on your desk at work. Weeping may endure for the night. But joy comes in the morning. Can I speak that to you this morning? Why did Jesus come? He said, and to provide for those who grieve. The purpose of Jesus coming is, Jesus says, I want you to be able to find relief from your grief. Psalm 34, 17, 18, the righteous cry out, the Lord hears them. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. What, what's the other reasons why Jesus showed up? I love this, and, and I know some of y'all have heard this term before, but this is where it comes from, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. How many of y'all have heard that term? Beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes. Can I tell you something? That came from Jesus. Jesus is saying, that's why I came. Now, I know the very first time that I ever heard that term, beauty for ashes, I was like, what, where is that and what does that mean? I looked it up. I'm kind of studying it. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, the first time I was really looking at it, I thought, I thought it meant time-wise. In other words, ashes are something that just kind of here today, they're, they're gone. And, but this crown of beauty, that's something eternal. And so Jesus says, I'm bringing you something that's lasting, not something that's fleeting, which is a great thought, but it's not what this text says. What this text is simply saying is the ashes, that's what you would take when you were mourning, when you were broken. You take ashes and you would put them on yourself, and God is saying this, I'm going to take those ashes that you've been mourning with, and I'm going to replace it with something solid. I'm going to replace it with beauty. A crown of beauty is what he actually says. He says this too. He says, uh, the oil of joy instead of mourning. And then the very last thing, and, and this, is, this is where it is. A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair, the garment of praise. Um, Old Testament, New Testament were written in two different languages. New Testament was written in what language? 
Greek. Old Testament was written in what? Hebrew. Hebrew. Okay. The Hebrew word here that we see for the word garment, ma'ate, ma'ate, and it simply means this, a covering, an outer garment, or a mantle. But then the Hebrew word that we, we see right here for the word praise is tahile, and it simply means this, glory, praise songs, praiseworthy actions. So when he says, I'm going to replace the spirit of despair with the garment of praise. So this is where we ask the question, who wore it better? Did Lucifer wear praise better or did we? Lucifer was made up of all these instruments. And Lucifer, hear me, Lucifer was created for worship. But can I tell you this? So were you. So were you. You were created for worship, but it's a choice. It's a choice. This morning when you got up, you made a choice of what you were going to wear, unless you're a male that's married. (laughs) Hey, hand me that material right there. But it's a choice. Will, will, Will I put this on? Because the reality is, the reality is inside of your closet, there's really very limited choices in there. One of them, one of them, the scripture says, is a spirit of despair. But the other, it says it's a, it's a garment of praise. And it's your choice to put it on. Now, can I just go ahead and say this? Yeah, I've seen the numbers. Dr. Chadwell, I've I've seen the numbers. I've seen the numbers of teen suicide. I've seen the numbers of divorce. I've seen the numbers of the Dow Jones. Yes, I've seen the numbers of families that are falling apart. Yes, and can I tell you something? If all you do is look at those numbers, I understand why so many people would go into their closet and pick out the spirit of despair. I get it. But can I tell you this? I also have encountered God and his faithfulness in the midst of the storm. Yes, I've been with the multitudes who have worshiped God and would not seal their lips with praise. Yes, I've seen how goodness and mercy are going to follow you all the days of your life. Yes. Yes. And because I've encountered those things and I've seen those things, I'm going to clothe myself 